We're in the middle of a series called The Shortest Epistles. And uh, in this series, we've been looking through um, some of the shortest books of the Bible. Uh, we've looked at uh, some of these short letters in the New Testament. We've kind of turned to the back, and we preached through 1 John a, a, a little over a year ago. And so we jumped in, and we did 2 John and 3 John, which are two of the shortest books of the Bible. And we finished up 3 John last week. And so today... We're going to look, or begin to take a look at uh, another short letter uh, called Jude, uh, named after its author. Um, it's, um, uh, he, he wrote this letter um, a little bit before uh, John, uh, but it's uncertain when he wrote it, maybe 67 to 90 A.D., but, but one of the reasons John wrote this letter is because he really, as you read through it, you'll see he really wanted to expose false teachers, and he wanted to call them out, and he wanted to call the church to defend the truth, and so uh, you know that that was really important to him, and and so he lays out this foundation for for the battle of doing this uh, right at the beginning of his letter, and then uh, in verse 24 at the close of his letter, those are. Uh, that's one of the uh, most popular verses in the in the uh, letter, I guess. But um, today, uh, what I want us to un begin to understand is how, in in light of false teaching, and we've got a lot of that going on today, and uh, we address that uh, in in John's letters a little bit, especially Third John. But but um, we want to find safety and security in Christ. We want to know who we are. We want to know what we believe. All that's important. So, but today we're just going to take a look at the introduction. We're going to look at the first two verses. And uh, I know a lot of people say, how in the world can you get a sermon out of just the introduction of a book? But, but really there's a lot here when you really start looking at the words. And so I want to talk about today, the title of the message is A Relationship Reminder. A Relationship Reminder. And, and in Jude introducing himself and the recipients of the letter, he really reminds us all of who we are, who he is. He identifies himself, and then he sort of identifies those who the letter's addressed to. And so uh, we're in this together, aren't we? And so I want us to re be reminded of who our relationship is with the Lord, who we are in Christ. And, and so it, it reminds me a lot of the series where we preached through Ephesians a while back and the, our identity in Christ. But we're going to read the first two letters, or first few verses in the letter. If you will, follow along with me. Jude writes this, uh, typical introduction, he identifies himself, he says, Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, sanctified by God the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ. And he simply says, mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. This is the word of God. Let's pray together. Our great God and Father, Lord, we do bow before you this morning. Lord, we thank you for your word today. God, we thank you for this message uh, uh, that can help us to know who we are and where we stand in you. And Lord, how we can defend the truth and deliver the message of gospel, Lord, a, uh, a word of hope to our world who needs it so desperately. So right now, Lord, speak to us in our hearts. Change us. Make us like Jesus, for it's in his name we pray. Amen. There was a, a renowned artist named Paul Gustave Dor. He lived in the, uh, the 19th century, and he was traveling in Europe, and he lost his passport, and, and he came to this border crossing. And like I said, he was famous. He, he did a lot of illustrations, like in papers and things like that, sort of a cartoonist, political cartoonist, and he did a lot of woodworking, so he, he was really well known. And when he got to the border crossing, he tried to explain to one of the guards that he had lost his passport, and he gave him his name, and he's hoping because of who he was, he'd be recognized, and they'd go ahead and let him cross the border. But the guard said, hey, he says, there's a lot of people that come through here and pretend to be somebody they're not trying to get across the border. And, and um, Dor was uh, persistent and and uh, he, he kept uh, encouraging God to let him pass and trying to prove his identity. So finally, uh, the, the guard says, all right. He says, I'll tell you what I'll do. He says, I'm going to give you a test. And he gave him a piece of paper and a pencil. And uh, he just he told him he, he, there were some peasants 
standing over to the side. He said, sketch those pe peasants on this piece of paper. And so um, just in a moment, just quickly and skillfully, Dora sketched out those peasants and handed the guy his paper, and the guard was convinced immediately that he was who he said he was, and he was allowed to pass. You know, the, the question today is this. You know, his work, excuse me, his work confirmed who he was. So I want to ask you today, who does your work reveal you are? What does your work reveal about you? And that's a good question for us to think about. I mean, his handiwork revealed who he really was. And, and what we do, I want to ask you, does your life, Reveal your faith in Christ. That's an important question. And if we're following Jesus and we're trying to live and love like Jesus, uh, then our life ought to show people uh, Jesus. And in this text, as Jude begins his letter, he wants to clear the air a little bit with some help in identifying the children of God. He identifies himself, like I said, and he identifies uh, uh, his recipients. And the reason, like I said, was because these false teachers that it infiltrated the church, and they were teaching false doctrines. A lot of them were uh, Judaizers trying to get folks back to the Old Testament, some of belief. Some of them were the Gnostics that we looked at and talked about in Ephesians and in 2nd uh, and 3rd John a little bit, the Gnostics who thought they had this special knowledge and all kinds of other different false teachers. They come in a lot of different flavors. Uh, but, uh, you know, false teachers are, have always been around, and they'll continue to always be around, until their day of judgment. There's a day coming, and Jude talks about that in, in the text, and we'll see that uh, as we work our way through in the coming weeks. But, but you know, the problem is a lot of folks in, in our churches, we don't recognize who we are and who Christ is enough to defend the faith and defend, defend ourselves. And uh, a lot of folks are drawn away and uh, they're swept away even to eternal punishment because they can't, their works don't reveal who they are in Christ. They don't have that real relationship with Christ. And so what I want to do today is I want us to look at Jude's introduction and to call our attention to a couple of key truths that remind you of your relationship with Christ. And so if you are one of his, if you're a child of God, if you've been saved, then this is you that, that we're looking at today. This is what we're talking about. And the first key truth is this. We're just going to look at two, actually. So we're going, but we're going to we're going to develop these two into uh, uh, a little bit. But the first one is this: remember who you are in Christ. Remember who you are in Christ. That's your identity in Christ, and we we spent a lot of time talking about that when we worked our way through Ephesians. But but when we look at this this text, Jude is identifying himself. And if you look at all the letters, it's important for the writer to identify themselves. People need to know who they are so that they can accept them as uh, an apostle or one who followed Christ, one who knew him. And, uh, and Jude was definitely that, I believe, as we, we take a look at that. He's the author. Now, the, the name Jude is a shortened form of the name Judas or Judah. And so there are a few other, about five other Judases in the New Testament, and one of them's really infamous, and we know him, right? And there was another disciple by that name. Uh, but, but this Jude make, tries to make it clear who he is. And he does it in a little bit of a unique way. First of all, he says, I'm a bondservant of Jesus Christ. Well, that doesn't really help identify him to his readers that much, but we're, we're going to talk about that a little bit more. But what he says next is, he says, the brother of James. And so, who in the world is James? Well, James uh, is the author of the letter James in the New Testament, who uh, was widely known throughout uh, the, the New Testament world as the half-brother of Jesus. He was the uh, uh, son of Mary and Joseph, probably the oldest besides Jesus, who really was not the son of Joseph, right? He was the son of God. And so, and so that, that's who he is. So, Jude is identifying himself as the half-brother of Jesus, another son of Mary and Joseph. And so that gives him a lot of credibility in the church, I would think, as even naming James 
as his brother and, and everybody knowing who he is, that would have given him a good bit of credibility. But see, they were all the sons of Mary. Uh, of course, only Jesus had God for a father. Uh, and, and so if you look at Matthew thirteen fifty five, some folks may wonder where this is. Just take a look at it. When Jesus uh, w was doing his work, the question was asked, is this not the carpenter's son? Is he not, is he not the son of Mary and his brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? You see that? So there he is. His name being listed last probably most likely means he was the youngest of the, of the boys. And so, uh, but, but uh, and just like uh, the rest of his family, if you look in John chapter 7, 5, you see that, you know, in Jesus' ministry, his brothers and sisters, they didn't believe him. You know, they didn't believe in him then. As a matter of fact, uh, if you go down into, uh, Mark, uh, into Mark's gospel, chapter 3 and verse 21, it says, but when his own people heard about him, uh, and they went to lay hold of him, for they said he's out of his mind. And so referring back to his brothers and sisters and the people who knew him growing up, you know, they thought he was mentally unsafe. They thought Jesus was crazy. Uh, but listen, so here's the thing. So up until the resurrection, most of Jesus' family thought he was crazy. Most of them did. But, but listen to this. Pay attention. The resurrection... <laughs> Changed everything. Because here, here was their brother going around telling everybody he's the son of God. They already knew that, uh, they already knew about his life. So if he had any sin, you'd think they would have pointed that out. But, uh, you know, but they probably thought it was obnoxious for him to think he's the son of God. <laughs> but then he died on a cross and rose from the grave just like he said he would. That changed everything. And uh, so now Jude identifies his bro brother as Jesus. I mean, he, he, he's, his brother is God in the flesh, and he follows him as his own Lord and, and Messiah. Think about that. To follow your own brother as God. That, that's a good testimony for people to say, hey, that says a lot about who Jesus was. How many of you, just think about your own family, would want to follow your siblings? As, as God, you know, I mean, I just, <laughs> I don't think that's ever going to happen anywhere. But, but here, he has this argument, but look how he, he identifies himself. He identifies himself as the bond servant, as the bond servant of Christ. And so, if he's the bond servant, then he's the slave of, of the Lord Jesus. And so, when you, when you go back and look at verse 1, you see this word bond servant, it's the Greek word doulos. And so, when you recognize who you are in Christ, one of the important things you need to realize is that you are purchased. When you become one of his, you become a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what bond servant basically means. It means a, a bought servant. And we all know what that is, don't we? Uh, and so he sees his relationship to Jesus not as brother to brother, but as a slave to a master. That's how he's identifying himself in his relationship with Jesus. I mean, I wonder what it was like growing up with an older brother like Jesus who literally could do no wrong. You know, I mean, I've heard people say that. My older brother, my older sister, they can do no wrong. Well, literally, Jesus could do no wrong. And so, I mean, you know, why, you, know you could hear Mary, why don't you be more like Jesus, you know? I mean, uh, I don't know how much of that went on, but it probably did. But here, here's the thing. Jude recognized the deity of Christ and surrendered himself to Christ as Lord. And in doing that, he enslaved himself to Jesus as his Lord. Uh, and so I want you to understand today, if you're one of his, you are also a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ because you have been purchased. You have been purchased. The Bible tells us that in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 20, Paul writes and he says, For you were bought at a price. <laughs> That's right. When you become a child of God, you have been bought with a price. And he says, therefore, glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. So when you go around making decisions on your own without doing what God wants you to do and what, what the Holy Spirit's telling you to do, uh, you're going against the one who really owns you. Just think of that. Remember that. 
Uh, and what were we purchased with? Well, Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 19 that it's, it was, we were purchased with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. And so here's the truth today. I want you to understand who you are in Christ. Listen, I don't belong to me and you don't belong to you. If you've been saved, uh, you know, it, well, listen, you, you, you don't belong to you. We are not our own. We belong to him because we've been purchased by his blood. And not only are you purchased, uh, not only is that one thing you need to know about who you are in Christ, but, but you're also called. <laughs> it, when you go back and look at verse 1, he, he addresses uh, this letter to the called. And what Jude likely means when he uh, refers to the called is the effectual calling of God that opens the heart to freely respond to the gospel. You see, there's a general call of God where uh, you know, he, he makes himself known kind of in a general revelation. And then there's an effectual call of God where he draws people to him uh, to, uh, in, in faith, in repentance. You know, the, the, the general call is like that familiar passage in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28 where Jesus says, Come unto me, all you who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Well, the effectual call is referred to in John 6, 44 when when uh, Jesus says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And he says, and I will raise him up in the last day. So there, there has to be that moment where the Spirit of God uh, convicts you because of the Word of God. And he calls you to come to him. You see, now, it, it's really a great mystery when you try to balance, you know, this effectual call of God for salvation you know, how God carries out the salvation of, of man and, and uh, through his divine will and balance with the free will response of man to the gospel message. I mean, it's a great mystery. You drive yourself crazy trying to figure it out because our God is so much higher and above and beyond anything that we can comprehend. But listen, what I want you to understand is this. Christ does not force his way into any human heart. What, what he does, listen to me, because for some of you, some of you maybe that are here, some of you that are watching online, this is what he's doing you, to you today. Christ summons you. He woos you. He pleads with you. He pursues you. He beckons you to come to him. And he awaits a faithful response from you. That's how he works. And listen, when you hear that call of God in your rapidly pulsating heart and you believe and respond in repentance and faith to that beckoning call of God, then you are predestined to be glorified and sanctified because then you are the called. The one who's responded to the faith of the gospel. Remember Paul wrote in Romans 8.30, he says, whom he predestined, these he called, and whom he called, he justified, and whom he justified, these he glorified. And so when you're, when you're in Christ, you're, you're purchased, and you're called. That calling is to a completion, to be made like Christ. That's what God's going to do with us, isn't it? And that can't come soon enough. Uh, another important thing to remember about who you are in Christ is that you are loved. The words called and the words sanctified in the text there in verse 1, those are modifiers, they're participles that modify uh, the, the, the first um, the word, the, the word purchase. So you're called and set apart. Because you've been bought. That's kind of the idea that, that he's given us there. And so this, this word in the New King James that's translated sanctified. Just that we don't have, can we get verse 1 back up there, Chris? When you look at that word sanctified, uh, in some translations, maybe in a translation you guys have, that word is translated loved or the beloved. And, uh, and so the idea is, you see the word sanctified in the actual Greek word that's there, it is the word that means to be set apart or to be holy by God, but it carries with it uh, some extra meaning. And so this is the reason some people render it loved or, or beloved, and, and uh, I think when you gather the whole idea and thought of, of 
what he's saying here. You can see that. See, the idea is that the called are, are both set apart and preserved by God, which indicates that, that great love of God. Because when you are His, when you've been bought and purchased and called, you're set apart to be made into the image of Christ. And that's your destiny. You're going to be made into the image of Christ once you're His. And so that's the great love of God. He keeps those who are His. You see that? And so when you believe in faith, you're adopted as a child of God into the family of God. God is now your Father, and He loves you with the perfect love of a father. That's unconditional love. That's the kind of love you get from God. You can't do anything to make God love you any more than he already does, and nothing you can do to make can make God love you less than he does. I hope you guys understand that today. The the word means to protect, to keep from harm, to preserve. And here the emphasis is that we who are purchased, we who are his, are kept safe. In our salvation by Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus' work on earth through his crucifixion and his, his sinless life, his crucifixion and resurrection, that's the work that obtains my salvation. And when you, are, and when you look at Christ's work in heaven, he's there interceding to God on our behalf. In John 17, we look at a verse from there in a few minutes. He's praying for all those who believe and for those who will believe that they will be kept. <laughs> Yeah, Jesus prayed that we'd be kept. So his work in heaven maintains my salvation. According to verse, verses 6 and verse 13 of Jude, God is preserving fallen angels and apostates for a day of judgment. But in verse 24, we see that God's preserving you and me, those of us who are his, for glory. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> That's something to rejoice about. That's who you are in Christ. You're a child of God, destined to be made in the image of God. You see, I think one of the weapons of the enemy is often to confuse you about who you are in Christ. And, uh, you know, once redeemed, um, you know, often because of sin and disobedience, you doubt your relationship with Christ. And, and, and listen, you're going to slip up. You're going to do things, and you're not going to, you're going to do things you wish you didn't do, and you're not going to do things you know you should do, and those things are going to discourage you, and they'll defeat you, and they'll lead you to depression. And if you don't remember that you're a child of God, if you really are a child of God, uh, they'll take you down a road you don't want to go. And, and that happens too much. And so, uh, you know, I want you to remember who you are in Christ. I want you to remember your relationship with the Lord. You know, this dilemma of an unclear sense of, of personal identity and, and relationship with the Lord, uh, it's important. It's in, illustrated in the life of a famous German philosopher named Friedrich Schleiermacher. The story is told that one day, as an old man, Slyrebarker was sitting alone on a park bench in the city, kind of caught up in his thoughts, depressed and lonely. And the policeman, thinking he was a vagrant, came by and he came over and he shook him and he says, Hey, who are you? Slyrebarker simply replied, I wish I knew. I wish I knew. Do you know who you are? <laughs> Do you know who you are? Do you belong to Christ? If you're one of His, you're a redeemed, purchased, called, loved child of God forever. Don't forget that. Never forget that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> there is another important point for you to remember in your relationship with Christ that we see in verse 2. I want to share that with you today. Not only is it important for you to remember who you are in Christ, it is equally important to remember what you have because of Christ. And obviously, you know, we've hit on some of that already, but, but just looking at verse 2, we see three important words. Mercy, peace, and love. You see that? I mean... A lot of times when you're reading scripture, you get to these introductions, you just read through it, and you want to get to something good, right? But there's some good stuff right here. Am I right? So don't rush through this verse as Jude mentions a prayer for those 
whom he's writing. Who's, what's he praying for? He prays for mercy and peace and love to be multiplied. Now, mercy is a characteristic in God that moves him to seek a relationship with people who really have no right to have a relationship with him. You know, that's God's mercy. Um, the word, word speaks of compassion and loving kindness. And, and the Greek word, elios, it, it's closely related to a Hebrew word that I know a lot of you ladies and some of you here in the church are familiar with. It's the, the word chesed. Chesed or hesed to some. But the Hebrew word is chesed, right? They got that guttural, you know. It's, but anyway, that's what it is. And, and that word is difficult to translate. You can't translate chesed into English with one English word. You have to use multiple words to translate it. Uh, it, it it's, it's most often in Scripture probably translated loving kindness, which is maybe that's a compound word, and so it's really more than one word, right? But, but, but that still doesn't do it justice. And, you know, it, it's more than just mercy. Sometimes it's translated mercy, but it's more than just mercy. It's more... Uh, than, than, than loving kindness. It's, it's more than, than just compassion. It's, it's this unique, gracious, undeserved, and unmerited favor of God to withhold his, the judgment that we all really deserve because of our sin and instead to bless those who are his with unbelievable favor. So really, the word chesed, or this mercy that's described here, is mercy and grace together, is what it is, if you know the difference and if, you're, if you understand what I'm talking about. But it's the characteristics of a God that, that it's this unique identifier of God that causes him to move to do for you and me what we can't do for ourselves. Oh, how he loves you and me. That's it. It's the loving kindness from God, like one man going down to Jericho experienced when he was robbed and left for dead, and a Samaritan who should have hated him saw him, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. That's it. That's the word. He had chesed upon him. That mercy, love, and grace of God. That's what it is. That's what he had on him. And he put that into action by actually caring for this man. You see, God saw us beaten to death by sin and Satan and his minions, left for dead, and he went into action. And he displayed his great mercy, love, and grace for us and sent his son, Jesus, to cleanse the wound of sin and to heal our souls. That's what he did. He made us, not just healed us, not just saved us, <laughs> but made us his own. See, when you are one of his, you enjoy abundant mercy. But you also enjoy abundant peace. He talks about peace. The, the word for peace in the Greek, arene, it, it's similar to another Hebrew word that most of y'all have probably heard. It's shalom. And, I, and if anybody understands shalom, it's, it's that you know, Hebrew greeting. And, and, you know, and, and most people just translate it peace. And it's the last part of the the, uh, the, the name of the city of Jerusalem, Jerusalem. It's, it's the city of peace. And, 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 and so it, it, but this word shalom, any Jew understands, it really encompasses more than just peace, as we understand peace in English. It, it, it's it's, it, it's all-encompassing of all areas of life where you experience blessing and favor and abundance. That's what, that's what he's talking about. And so Paul, Paul talks about this in his letter to the Roman churches. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 1, he, he reminds us that this kind of peace, 
this all-encompassing peace where you're blessed in all things, you can only get that from God. He says, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. How? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. You want peace with God? That comes from a relationship with Christ. Without Christ, there's no peace, right? We, we, we've seen that a lot, right? No Christ, K-N-O-W, no peace, N-O, right? But N-O Christ, no Christ, then in in no peace, right? I, I said it backwards, but anyway, uh, maybe. But y'all get the picture. No Christ, no peace. But in O Christ, in O peace, right? <laughs> but it's the truth. If you know Christ, you'll have peace. If you don't know Christ, there is no peace. That's the point I'm trying to make. When, when while in prison, Paul understood this peace that that comes from God. He said uh, in 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 his letter to the Philippians in chapter four, verses six and seven, he says, "Be anxious for nothing, but in everything." By prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Then he says this, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And so we enjoy God's mercy and peace, and we also enjoy his great love. Uh, theologian C.H. Dodd says, To say God is love implies all his activities, loving activity. God is love. So you know what that means? It means if he creates, he creates in love. If he rules, he rules in love. If he judges, he judges in love. Everything is done out of love. Look at the, this love of God for you expressed in the prayer of Jesus in John chapter 17. I, I mentioned this chapter a little bit earlier. If you've never read John 17, read John 17 and read this prayer of Jesus. This is the real Lord's prayer right here. It, it's awesome. He says, he says in this, Speaking of the, the unity in the Trinity, in verse 22, he says, I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one. He's praying for believers, and that the world may know that you have sent me. And listen to this. And he says, and have loved them as you have loved me. Oh, man. Jesus prayed that God would love you like he loves Jesus. Mm. Oh man, thank you, Jesus. He already did. <laughs> Jesus knew what to pray for. He knew that God already loves those who are His, like His own children. In Romans 8 31 through 39, we see that, that nothing can separate us from the love of God that is ours in Christ Jesus. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we see that Paul reminds us that God and God's love will never end. It will never end. It will never fail. That's God's love. When you come to Christ, you receive some awesome blessings. <laughs> Too numerous to list, really, but among them are mercy. Peace and an awesome love. That's the, these are meant to be passed on through your life as you seek to live and love like Jesus. Don't forget that. Christ wants these things to flow through you to the people in your life. <sighs> At age 16, Andor Folds was already a skilled pianist. But he was, he was having a bad year. And in, in the midst of this young Hungarian's personal struggles, one of the most renowned pianists of the day came to Budapest. Emil von Saar was famous not only for his abilities, but he was also the last surviving pupil of the great pianist Franz Liszt. So Von Sauer suggested that Folds play for him, this young 16-year-old prodigy. <laughs> and Folds obliged with, with some of the most difficult works. He, he played Bach and Beethoven and, and Schumann. And when he finished, Von Sauer walked over to him and kissed him on the forehead. <laughs> and he said this, he said, My son, when I was your age, I became a student of lit. He kissed me on the forehead after my first lesson. And he said, take good care of this kiss. It comes from Beethoven, who gave it to me after hearing me play. <laughs> and he says, I've waited for years 
to pass this sacred heritage on. But he says, but today I feel you deserve it. (laughs) Wow. Think about that. Well, listen. While we don't really deserve anything from God, (laughs) we don't deserve God's kiss. But oh, how he's reached down from heaven with a gracious, loving kiss of blessings. <laughs> We're blessed to be children of God and to receive the blessings of God. And if you want to overcome the temptations that you face, and if you want to see victory in a generation uh, that, that's swelling with false teachers and uh, hypocrisy and warped biblical teachings where people uh, gather up teachers for their own ears to hear, to have them preach and say the things they want to hear that make them feel better about themselves and to, re- and, and to satisfy their own personal agendas. Listen, if you want to be able to overcome all that and to stand on truth, you must remember who you are in Christ. And you must remember what you have in Christ. (laughs) Because if you're not in a real relationship with Him, you'll be carried away with whatever makes you feel good. You know, in a few weeks, we'll participate in one of our biggest opportunities to impact a lot of people in our community on Halloween night by dressing up and pretending to be someone we're not or something we're not. Yeah, I mean, it's fun to dress up and pretend to be Batman or Superman or Mr. Incredible. <laughs> I mean, you know, hey, it's a, there's a thrill for some, not me, to be a Disney princess. <laughs> right? Or, or any comic superhero or whatever. But, but listen, when you realize who you are in Christ and what you have in Christ, you won't want to be anybody else. That's right. You are in Christ who God made you to be. Be the best you can be for His glory by receiving those blessings. And walking in faith. Listen, I am blessed to be a slave of King Jesus who's purchased me with his own blood and called me to complete me, to be like him. (laughs) That's what he's got in store. I'm making it hard on him. (laughs) You know? But you know, he loves me. And he protects me. And he showers me with, with mercy. And he blesses me with peace. Because I am His and I am secure with Him forever. That's it. Oh, that gives me hope. Because my eternity with Jesus don't even depend on me. It's all on Him. You know what that does to me? That makes me want to love Him. That makes me want to serve Him. Oh man, and that makes me want to help other people to follow Him. And love him and serve him. You know the important thing today is what about you? What about you? Who are you? Who are you? Are you somebody who walked an aisle, repeated a prayer and got wet? Are you a person who felt that affects your call of God on your heart. That you really couldn't turn him away. You, 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 you fell into his arms and he's transforming you and he's chastening you and he's shaping you and he's leading you. All the while you know he's loving you. Is that your life? Is that who you are? Listen, today, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that He died on the cross for your sins and rose from the dead, you can receive Him as He beckons you to turn away from sin and self and surrender to Him in faith as Lord. If you will, if you'll do that, you will find yourself safe and secure in Christ forever and you'll be blessed beyond measure. 
Who can reject that? And so right now, we want to give you an opportunity to respond. Maybe, maybe you're sitting here this morning and in your heart, right now, you feel the Holy Spirit of God. <sighs> Feels like your heart's about to be ripped out of your chest. And you know that God's calling you to turn to Him and to turn away from sin and to turn away from your life and to give yourself to Him. Listen, don't, don't reject that today. Fall into the arms of Jesus. Say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner and I need Your salvation. I need Your Spirit. Come into me. Save me and change me. If you need that today and if you feel that, cry out to Him. The Bible says if you'll do that, if you'll call out to Him, that He'll save you. He will. And if, you, if you'll do that, and maybe you've already done that, or maybe you're doing that at home, we want you to let us know. Come on down. Let us rejoice with you. Let us pray with you. Let us help you take those next steps of being baptized and becoming a part of the church and growing in your faith. But, you know, I, there's a lot of folks here today who say, you know, Derek, I know I'm a believer. I know I've been saved. But, man, I forgot who I was. I've not been living right. I've not been... I've not been living for the Lord, and today I, I, I want to do that. I want to make things right. So right now is the time to do that. Just confess that to the Lord. He'll forgive you. He'll cleanse you, and he'll set you straight. And we're here to help you do that. So listen, if you have a burden, a need, if you made a decision, we're, Jeremy's going to come. The band's going to come. We're going to sing. We're going to give you an opportunity to respond in faith right now. Let's pray, and then we'll do that. Father, we give you this time this morning. We pray, Father, that you would be Glorified in this moment as you draw people to, to yourself, God, as you save souls and lives. Lord, right now, this is, this is the time. Father, draw them to you. Lord, save souls for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.